There is a voice that stands out amongst the noise. A brave and bold voice that speaks of equality, family, and the importance of education. A beacon of hope and optimism. That voice belongs to Michelle Obama. I grew up in a working class neighborhood on the south side of Chicago where people work hard to make ends meet, but where families are tight-knit with strong values. From humble beginnings to the First Lady of the United States and beyond, Michelle Obama has inspired millions of people around the world with her honesty and hard-earned wisdom. It has been eight years since I first came to this convention to talk with you about why my husband should be president. Since leaving the White House in 2017, Michelle has sustained momentum in her work for empowering young people. We are just like you, just kids who worked a little hard and dreamt pretty big. She's one of the most well-loved first ladies in history and one of the most admired people in the U.S. The release of her massively successful memoir, Becoming, has revealed so much more about her incredible journey through life and only bolstered her fame and influence. She even made an appearance at the 2019 Grammy Awards. Be determined. Be hopeful, be empowered, empower yourselves with a good education, build a country worthy of your boundless promise, lead by example with hope, never fear. Discover the inspirational story of Michelle Obama. I think everybody knew Barack Obama was a huge star. That was undeniable. I don't think people realize what a star she would become. Ladies and gentlemen, the first lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. For those of you who may not know much about my background, I grew up in a working class neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, where people work hard to make ends meet, but where families are tight knit with strong values. Michelle Obama was born Michelle LaVon Robinson on January 17th, 1964. Oftentimes, Michelle talks about the closeness of her family, growing up in their quaint home on the south side of Chicago. On her own Instagram page, Michelle shared a glimpse into her childhood, seen here posing with her mother Marion and father Frazier. My dad worked as a pump operator at the city water plant, and my mom stayed home to take care of me and my big brother Craig. Uh, we lived in a really small apartment. And my brother and I shared a bedroom that was divided in half by a wooden partition, giving us each our own little tiny rooms that fit just a twin bed and a small desk. So we didn't have much space, but we had a whole lot of love. And perhaps like a lot of you, we, we grew up surrounded by our extended family. I had grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins living just blocks away from my family's apartment. And my great aunt and uncle actually lived one floor below in the same apartment house. So our, our home was often busy with family coming and going. And because our apartment was so small, there wasn't much privacy. I can remember how hard it was to concentrate on my homework because someone was always talking or watching TV right next to you. I often woke up at four in the morning when the house was finally quiet just so that I could concentrate and finish my schoolwork. I remember just dreaming of having a space of my own, away from all the family obligations that were always popping up. As my great aunt and uncle grew older, my parents took charge of caring for them. My dad would help my uncle shave and, and get dressed each morning, and my mom would dash downstairs in the middle of the night to make sure that my aunt was okay. So we constantly felt the struggle to balance our family responsibilities and the schoolwork, the activities, and the goals that we had for ourselves. And through it all, my parents 
fully expected us to do both, to achieve our dreams and be there for our family. And they also knew uh, that a good education was the ultimate key to our success. My parents told me every day I could do anything. I could grow up to be a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, whatever, but only if I worked as hard as I could to succeed in school. Frazier Robinson suffered from multiple sclerosis, a debilitating illness that took a serious toll on his life. When she lost her father to the illness in 1991, it rocked Michelle's world. She called him the hole in her heart. Her family was like Beaver Cleaver, uh, that it was so wholesome, just they earned a little bit less money. But this really was an important foundation for her and that she really loves family, loves being around family, and that you know family is really important to her. And that really shined through. I didn't want to let my parents down. So I worked hard in school. I read everything I could get my hands on. I did my absolute very best on every single assignment. I did everything in my power to be a good student. I dreamed of one day going to one of the best universities in America. But despite my efforts, there were still people in my life who told me that I was setting my sights too high, that a girl like me couldn't get into an elite university. It was like these folks were trying to put me in a little box, a box that fit their constrained expectations of me. And after a while, I started to wonder, well, maybe I was dreaming too big. What if these folks were right? See, back then, I, I didn't know what my future held. I didn't know that I'd be accepted to a top university. I didn't know that I'd go on to get a law degree and become an NGO director and a hospital execu executive and eventually first lady of the United States. Those kinds of achievements seemed totally out of reach when I was your age. I was just a working class kid from a good community with limited resources. Neither of my parents and hardly anyone in my neighborhood went to university. And I wasn't even sure my family could afford the tuition. I didn't have anyone to help me study for entrance exams. And the fact that I was a girl and that I was black, well, that certainly didn't help things either. She aimed high, applying at Princeton University, where she was accepted and began her studies in 1981. Four years later, she graduated with honors, but Michelle didn't stop there. She would go on to study and earn a degree from Harvard Law School in 1988. In August of 1989, Michelle LaVon Robinson was working as an associate in the Chicago law firm Sidley Austin when she was assigned to mentor a summer intern. That summer intern was Barack Hussein Obama. Barack landed the internship off the back of his exceptional work as a law student at Harvard University. In her book, Becoming, Michelle expresses that the glowing praise that surrounded the confident young Barack seemed at odds with his easygoing attitude. He was like no one she had ever met. Despite a fluttering interest in this cool cat from Hawaii, Michelle being career focused refused to date. It's safe to say that Barack had other ideas. He was definitely pursuing her, and she had her reservations, and eventually he won her over. Famously, the couple's first kiss is commemorated at 53rd and South Dorchester in Chicago. A quaint plaque on a rock reads, On our first date, I treated her to the finest Baskin Robbins had to offer, our dinner table doubling as the curb. I kissed her, and it tasted like chocolate. Barack proposed just two years after that first kiss. On October 3rd, 1992, Michelle LaVon Robinson took the name the world would come to know, Mrs. Michelle Obama. In a nostalgic Instagram post in 2018, Michelle shared a photograph from that special day at Trinity United Church of Christ. It's plain to see the joy on their faces, a joy that remains present to this day. If I had worry about who liked me and who thought I was cute when I was your age, I wouldn't be married to the President of the United States today. 
so. But I think one of the things that stands out in the relationship between Barack and Michelle Obama is just how close they are, how much they are equal partners, how they see themselves as a team, that their relationship isn't perfect, but they tend to be honest about whatever issues they have with one another. But it's very clear to see that they have such a strong love for one another. In politics, a lot of these political wives and husbands are often plagued by different scandals. You know, they're in the tabloids for different accusations of things happening. And you, you have to admit for anyone either on the right or on the left that this was really a scandal-free couple. There really wasn't a lot of noise about anything going on in their relationship other than the fact that they clearly loved each other, cared for one another, and saw themselves as equals. Malia and Sasha, their daughters, were born in 1998 and 2001. But the birth of their children wasn't without complication. In her memoir, Michelle revealed for the first time the couple's struggle with infertility. Despite becoming pregnant, Michelle miscarried. They were both torn apart by feelings of failure and brokenness. It was only when turning to IVF treatment that they were able to conceive two healthy daughters. In the lead up to the election campaign in the 2008, it was just tremendous turmoil, discontent, because the economy had been doing so badly. There was one point in 2008 that 170,000 jobs were being lost in a month. Unemployment was almost at 8%, and there was real pessimism and concern about the U.S.'s future. I mean, there was a general consensus that the invasion of Iraq had not been going well, that the U.S. had overstretched itself. And there was real questions about U.S. leadership just in the world and whether or not it was capable of getting itself out of this terrible recession that was hitting. You know, I would, I would sometimes get another question that people would ask me, not just about my name. They would ask me, you seem like a nice young man, family man, you, you got a fancy law degree, you teach at a fine law school. You could be doing so many things. Why would you want to go into politics? Why would you want to go into politics? And the question's understandable because we feel cynical about politics sometimes. Even those of us who are active sometimes feel that our leadership is long on rhetoric but short on substance. They sometimes feel that politics is a business and not a mission. Barack Obama didn't get into Columbia University right away. He actually started off and went to Occidental College in the U.S. in California. And then he transferred into Columbia University in Ivy League school. Uh, but from there on, his career really soared. Uh, he would eventually get a law degree from Harvard Law, and he would be one of the editors, the first African-American editor of the Harvard Law Review. And then he continued to engage in community activity in the state of Illinois in Chicago. And from there on, he became an Illinois state senator for eight years. And he gained some experience in the Illinois state senate, and then this propelled him to the national stage when he would become a US senator in 2004. You know, he lived a very solitary life when he was in DC, and he didn't uproot his family to be there. But his greatest achievements weren't going to be in the Senate. And he, he probably knew that he had the level of fame that really no other senator had achieved at that point, given what he had actually accomplished. We are all connected as a people, that all of us share something, that these children right here lined up waiting for the red hot chili peppers, that yeah, that I've got an investment in them even though they're not my children. Just like you have an investment in the children in the south side of Chicago who are trying to figure out whether they've got a decent education. And it's that idea that we are all connected, that I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, that we have a set of mutual obligations towards each other that express themselves not only in our families, not only in our communities, not only in our places of worship, but also in our government. 
Barack Obama's political career was soaring. His decision to run for the 2008 presidential election was, in his own words, a family decision, and one Michelle met with a great deal of hesitation. I think it was difficult for Michelle to come to terms with the fact that Barack wanted a political career. She's very civic-minded, but she hates politics. And so she really didn't want to get into any kind of career where there would be mudslinging and um, all the different things that come with it. But as always, she wanted to support Barack in whatever aspirations that he had. I think she understood that he had aspirations for greatness and was capable of achieving these types of things. And that he's sort of a once in a lifetime type of person, um, that a, a type of candidate that the world had never really seen before, definitely the US had never seen before, and that she was gonna need to support him. Um, and that that didn't necessarily mean that she had to let go of her own ambitions. Uh, it just meant you know, that she needed to be side by side with him um, and supporting him all along the way. I'm sure she was one of his biggest uh, fans, but also one of the people that he trusted the most in terms of offering him advice. As Barack Obama's fight for the 2008 presidential election began, the eyes of the American public turned toward their prospective first lady. When she was originally campaigning with Barack in 2008, what's impossible to think of now is that she was thought of as a liability because of several things that she had said. She was being interviewed by reporters in early 2008, and, and she had mentioned this is the first time in my adult life that I am proud to be an American. And this really didn't play well. People didn't like the fact that uh, she was emphasizing race too much. Uh, then her dissertation was published when she was a student, which emphasized how difficult it would be to be an African-American in a white university. That also didn't play over very well. And there were caricatures of her as this angry black woman who was militant um, and was overly focusing on race. And they decided that they were going to basically give her a, a complete makeover, a complete image makeover, because they felt that she was coming across as too forceful. But that's part of who she was. If she wanted to defend her husband, you know, she's a Harvard-educated lawyer. She would do it in a forceful and efficient and effective manner. But that wasn't playing across well, given some of the other events that were going on at that time. And so they gave her this big image makeover, which they unveiled at the Democratic Convention in August of 2008. And it was really successful. As I tuck that little girl in and her little sister into bed at night, you see, I, I think about how one day they'll have families of their own. And how one day they and your sons and daughters will tell their own children about what we did together in this election. Tell them, they'll tell them how this time we listen to our hopes instead of our fears. In her speech, and she was a great speaker, just as Barack is, she mentioned family quite a bit. She really emphasized her maternal role and she exuded a lot of warmth. And it was really natural, this one. How this time in this great country where a girl from the south side of Chicago can go to college and law school and the son of a single mother from Hawaii can go all the way to the White House. That we committed ourselves. And one of the things that people say when they think about Michelle Obama is her authenticity and how honest she is, how frank she is. And this came across really effectively in this particular speech, but in also in other campaign speeches that she has done subsequently. So tonight, in honor of my father's memory and my daughter's future, out of the gratitude for those whose triumphs we mark this week, and those whose everyday sacrifices have brought us to this moment. Let us devote ourselves to finishing their work. Let us work together to fulfill their hopes and let's stand together to elect Barack Obama, President of the United States of America. Thank you. God bless you and God bless America. 
they felt that without sort of making her over as just the person that she was, I mean, there, I think the problem was the sides of her that were maternal and warm weren't really shining through. And, and they felt that they needed to tap into these sides. It wasn't that they completely changed her personality. It's that they sort of edited her personality. It's an edited version of the way she really is, which she was able to later reveal, you know, just being a little bit more frank, more honest about things. And her honesty actually just appealed to people. Now you know why I asked her out so many times, even though she said no. You, you want a persistent president. Michelle, Malia, and Sasha traveled the length of the country during what was a grueling campaign schedule. Delivering speeches, hosting fundraisers, Michelle did her part to support Barack, but it wasn't without its challenges. The campaign experience was draining for all of Barack Obama's family. Uh, they were constantly on the road and having to deal with, you know, raising kids on the road. Um, Michelle Obama was having to give a lot of speeches. Uh, and this kind of carried on into the eight years that she was in office. I mean, she was exhausted. And he talked about how she was looking forward to being able to do so many things that she couldn't do before. I mean, it was something that, uh, you know, she really gave up a lot uh, in order to support him and, and for this goal of achieving something for the greater good. I mean, I think she really felt that this was something that she needed to chip in on and be supportive of. Not because she really wanted to do it, that this would have been her first choice, but she just felt it was the right thing to do. I think she knew that everything, starting from the campaign to the way she adjusted her um, image for the campaign, to the way she kind of adjusted her image to be this new type of first lady, all of this stuff was a huge sacrifice to her. This wouldn't have been her choice. This wouldn't have been what she wanted to do. She didn't have these types of political aspirations. But I think she saw this as all part of something that needed to be achieved um, just for the greater good of U.S. Uh, society, uh, political culture, just the country at this time needed optimism and needed these types of policies. The, the actual night itself, there was quite a bit of optimism because Obama was going into the night with a lead in the polls by five to 10%. Uh, and there was a feeling that his campaign had been very dynamic and that he was likely to flip some states. So in the end, you know, you had him winning 338 electoral votes, winning 52% of the vote, and he flipped seven states that had been previously in the hands of uh, Republicans. And that was significant. I think some of the most significant wins were in the Rust Belt, namely Ohio, uh, but also Virginia, of course, North Carolina, and Florida. And these wins came out earlier in the night and it became clear he was going to be the winner. But at election night, the electoral victory was, for many people, one of the greatest moments for them. And they probably agreed with what Michelle Obama had said earlier that year, that it was a moment where Americans felt proud. It was definitely a moment for minorities the African-American community, even the Hispanic community, um, that they felt that they had achieved something. It was just one of the most impressive things that the U.S. had accomplished. This city was the first stop on my very first international trip as First Lady. And during my time here, I visited with the girls from Elizabeth Garrett Anderson School. And as I, I stood before that room full of girls six years ago, all I could think about was how much promise they each had inside of them, how much passion and hope and intelligence each of them could bring to our world. And in many ways, those girls were the inspiration for so much of my work as First Lady. Work to give girls like them and like you and like those 62 million girls around the world the opportunities you deserve.
On a cold January morning in 2009, Barack Obama was inaugurated as the 44th President of the United States. Standing close by his side, holding the Bible he swore his oath upon, was America's new First Lady. Most First Ladies are expected to be supportive, to stay out of politics, to stay out of controversies, to choose to get behind policies that are non-controversial. And they weren't expected necessarily to have a career other than being a supportive political wife. And that really was the mold. Hillary Clinton broke the mold before Michelle Obama in some ways because she herself was such an ambitious person. But the key difference here is Hillary Clinton always had political aspirations. And this would dog her time period while she was um, Bill Clinton's wife because of all the different scandals going on. There were questions as to why they were even together. And many were very cynical about the fact that, well, this is because she one day wants to be, you know, a politician, a senator, the president, and so forth. Michelle Obama was able to balance the ambition of Hillary Clinton with some of the warmth and caringness that previous first ladies were able to exude in ways that really hadn't been seen before. And now today, being back here in London, while looking out at all of your faces, I'm once again filled with the same feeling I had six years ago. I see a room full of business leaders and surgeons and barristers. I see women who are going to win elections and science competitions and arts awards. I see leaders who will inspire folks, not just here in Tower Hamlets, but all across the country and all around the world. That's what I see. Because I know what's inside of girls like you and like me. I know how hard we'll fight for our families, how deeply we care about our communities, how much of a difference we can make for those around us. Our glorious diversity, our diversities of faiths and colors and creeds, that is not a threat to who we are. It makes us who we are. Inclusivity was at the heart of Michelle Obama's tenure as First Lady. If you look at her career as a First Lady, she chose issues that were really apolitical. Uh, she wanted to improve uh, the livelihoods of veterans and their families. She worked to improve nutrition for children and to improve their mobility and physical fitness. Um, and she really cared you know, about families and that's what she emphasized in the end, something that really wasn't gonna be controversial in any way, shouldn't have been controversial. At times it was controversial just because the first family uh, did was on the receiving end of criticism from time to time. Um, but in the end, you know, she had very high popularity ratings, um, higher than Barack Obama's popularity ratings. And now as people are looking back on her career as a first lady, she's one of the most well-loved first ladies in, in history and one of the most admired people in the U.S. just recently. During her time as first lady, Michelle Obama focused on four key initiatives. Let's move, reach higher, joining forces, and let girls learn. Let's Move promoted healthy living to children. You know, kids, you guys, young people, you guys have my heart. And uh, I said this in um, Belfast earlier, it's so true. <laughs> Look, my girls know I can embarrass them and love them to death, but young people, you guys move me in ways that you don't even imagine. Michelle Obama's views were in line with Barack Obama about inclusivity and equality. And she knew that there were very high levels of inequality uh, in the US still that really affected children. And one way of improving this was to ensure that children had access to healthy foods. And she made that one of the issues of her um, time as first lady was to improve access uh, to healthy lunches in schools, which is really critical for kids who are learning and um, need to have proper nutrition in order to absorb information well. Uh, she wanted to make sure that kids who were sedentary were moving better because this would, these improvements to their physical health, she knew how critical that would be to improving their mental health. 
And she was a champion of, uh, you know, exercising and being healthy and waking up early um, and um, eating healthy to the best of her ability. And she would go on talk shows and talk about this. And generally, you know, this was well received. And she cared about children. She showed she cared about children. She cared, she cared about people who um, had been neglected in the past. And she also supported Barack Obama's policies um, that fought for marriage equality and other forms of inclusivity. Um, and both of them also were fighting for equal pay rights for, for women. And that was actually one of the signature pieces of his legislation during the first 100 days. In lines with her goals as First Lady, um, Michelle Obama established this South Lawn Vegetable Garden. And a lot of it was about sustainability, uh, getting kids to be excited about foods and how foods are grown. And it was considered to be a huge success. Reach Higher began as an initiative to inspire students to remain committed to their education, to enroll in college and pursue academics. This country should be doing everything in our power to give more kids the chance to go to schools just like this one. We should be doing everything we can to put college within the reach of more young people. I want you to look at me and Barack and all these wonderful leaders and understand that we are you. We are just like you. Just kids who worked a little hard and dreamt pretty big and got to do some wonderful things. And when you get to that special place, I want you to understand it is your duty and your responsibility to give back to the community that made you who you are. So you never forget home, right? You never forget home. And what my girls are learning is that every day their home gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It is no longer just the South Side of Chicago or Washington, D.C., but it is Moneygall, it is Dublin, it is the world. And that is true for you. Well, Michelle Obama always uh, emphasized education. She was a really ambitious person. You know, she had a degree from, a law degree from Harvard. Uh, she always pushed her, her daughters to, you know, achieve the most that they could. And she championed women going to school uh, and, you know, focusing on their careers. Uh, but she was able to do this in a way that didn't offend um, other women that may have made, you know, a career being a homemaker. You know, her own mom was a homemaker. And she was able to balance this a little bit better than some previous first ladies like Hillary Clinton, who famously made the mistake of saying that she wasn't going to be at home baking cookies. Um, Michelle Obama was able to balance ambition, strength with maternal energy and, and warmth uh, in ways that I think really motivated people. Let Girls Learn was launched in March 2015 as part of a global effort to provide access to education for 62 million girls in developing countries without such opportunities, but also to drive home to all young women the importance of a good education. And I'm here because when I look out at all of these young women, I see myself. I may come from a country that's an ocean away, but man, I'm a bit older than you all. Yeah, I am. I know I don't look it, but I'm just a little older. When I was growing up, there were very few black women at high levels in business or politics or science on TV. So I didn't have many professional role models to look up to. And I have a feeling that my experience might feel similar or familiar to some of you. Maybe you look at the leaders in your businesses and laboratories and government and wonder whether there's a place for someone like you. Maybe you've heard about the kinds of tutors and prep courses and other advantages that wealthier students can afford. And you wonder how, how you ever will compete. Maybe you feel like no one's paying attention to you, like you're lost in the shuffle at home or in this huge city and you wonder whether it's worth it to even aspire to be something great. And maybe you read the news and hear what folks are saying about your religion, and you wonder if people will ever see beyond your headscarf to who you really are. 
instead of being blinded by the fears and misperceptions in their own minds. And I know how painful and how frustrating all of that can be. I know how angry and exhausted it can make you feel. But here's the thing. With an education from this amazing school, you all have everything, everything you need to rise above all of the noise and fulfill every last one of your dreams. And it is so important that you do that, not just for yourselves, but for all of us. Because you all have a unique perspective. You have a unique voice to add to the conversation. You know what it's like when a family struggles to make ends meet. You know what it's like to be overlooked and underestimated because of who you are or what you believe in or where you come from. And the world needs more girls like you growing up to lead our parliaments and our boardrooms and our courtrooms and our universities. We need you. We need people like you tackling the pressing problems we face, climate change and poverty, violent extremism, disease. And while all of that might sound a little daunting, I just want you to remember that you don't have to do this alone. There are millions of people like me and my husband, Dr. Ogden, and so many leaders here in the United Kingdom and all around the world who are standing with you. We are doing everything we can to break down the barriers that stand in your way. We want to make sure that every door is open to girls like you, and not just here in England, not just in America, but in every corner of the globe. And that starts with making sure that every girl on this planet has the kinds of opportunities you all have to get the education and to succeed. As you've heard right now, there are more than 62 million girls around the world who are not in school. Girls whose families don't think they're worthy of an education or they can't afford it. Girls who live too far away from the nearest school and have no transportation. Girls like Malala Yousafzai, who are assaulted, kidnapped, or killed just for trying to learn. And this isn't just a devastating loss for these girls. It's a devastating loss for all of us who are missing out on their promise. One of these girls could have the potential to cure cancer or start a business that transforms an industry or become the next president or prime minister who inspires her country. But if she never sets foot in a classroom, chances are she will never discover or fulfill that potential. I mean, education is critical to our society but particularly for women, because so many years women didn't have the opportunity to get educated. Oftentimes they were told, you know, that they were gonna just have a career staying at home. Um, and that was really all that they were capable of. They were told that they weren't very intelligent. And without women getting the chance to educate themselves, they don't really have any opportunities. And it's really critical to breaking all these glass ceilings, improving equal pay for women, but also ensuring that you know women are able to just even get into the workforce and just to do whatever they want to do. As I tell girls whenever I meet them, I wouldn't be here, sitting here, not just in this chair, but in the life that I have if it weren't for my education. Uh, I know that when, when you hear the phrase, knowledge is power, it's true. Um, through my education, I didn't just develop skills, I didn't just uh, uh, develop the ability to learn, but I developed confidence. We were not put on this earth just to be good mothers or good wives. We were here to be good citizens and good individuals. Um, and that takes investment. And I want girls to start practicing that at a very early age, not being so selfless uh, that they can't look out for themselves. Helping people is what great nations and great people do. Again and again, Michelle Obama has repeated her ethos that the strong bonds of family are essential to the betterment of oneself and also the greater good of society. This is an ethos that the former First Lady fashioned her own life upon. It was clear to the world each and every day 
that the Obama administration held office, that the Obamas, as the first family, shared an unparalleled love and closeness. You are supported by such wonderful families and such strong communities and traditions. Uh, those things, just understand, don't ever take those things for granted because all of that gives you that strong foundation that you are gonna need, a foundation that's gonna uh, allow you to become anything that you wanna be because it really starts with family. You know, I am here because I came from a strong foundation all the way in Chicago. And it has lifted me up, my family, my community, to be able to stand here today as First Lady of the United States. Michelle Obama's mother, Marion Shields Robinson, lived in the White House to maintain those strong family bonds. Michelle Obama is incredibly close to her mother. And she always admired her mother. Her mother was always there for her, you know, at home cooking every meal. And she had a really, really idyllic upbringing. And this close-knit family, in some ways, it was something that Barack Obama lacked um, because his parents had split up um, and he moved around quite a bit. Uh, but I think that the decision for Michelle's mom to move into the White House with them illustrates how close they really are, how much Michelle relies on her mom to support her and to just be there for their daughters and to provide the family a foundation and some normalcy. The media even nicknamed her the first grandmother. I think some families having your mother-in-law live with you wouldn't be ideal, but that, you know, you, you really don't understand how close this family is and how supportive, you know, she is to, to their daughters, but also to Barack and Michelle. And I've seen it again and again and again that what our parents told us really is true that if we get our education, we can do anything. We can lift up ourselves to heights we could never imagine. We can pay forward all of the love and support that our families have poured into us. And we can truly be builders of a new day. That is your work. In an interview with CBS in 2018, Marion Shields Robinson shared her reasons for moving into the White House and keeping the family as close as possible. I felt like this was going to be a very hard life for both of them. Yeah. And I want, was worried about their safety. Mm -hmm. And I was worried about my grandkids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what got me to move to D.C. I think for Barack and Michelle's children, Sasha and Malia, growing up in the White House probably wasn't easy. They had some advice from the previous first children, uh, the Bush twins, uh, Jenna and Barbara Bush. They, they actually took them under their wing and, and gave them a lot of helpful advice. But one of the things that made it easier for them was that they had uh, such a strong family. They had their, their grandmother living with them. They had their mother ensuring that, you know, they're able to live as normally as possible. And something that is notable about those eight years for them was that there was never anything negatively reported on them, ever. And it could be, you know, the media was, you know, exercising some caution there. But even since they have now, you know, become younger adults and are no longer um, living in the White House, they have earned a reputation for just being really solid, uh, well-behaved girls that have been really raised well. And a lot of this has been attributed to the work that, you know, Michelle had done in the White House, but also um, Michelle and Barack as a family, just ensuring that they had some level of stability and normalcy, you know, in spite of the fact that they were living in very abnormal conditions. Early today, as you heard, Malia and Sasha and I visited the long room at Trinity College. As you know, I don't know if many of you have been there, it's like Hogwarts. As Sasha pointed out, it's a huge room with shelf after shelf full of books, a beautiful place. And I hope that all of you aspire to go there, if not study there, um, but just to go and experience what it's like to be surrounded by so much history and so much power. And the girls had the chance to explore those shelves and trace their iris 
and uh, lineage, which was a very powerful thing to find out that these girls that were born on the south side of Chicago can trace their roots back here to Ireland, uh, way back to the 1600s. Um, that was very powerful for me as their mother, and hopefully it will something be something that they cherish for the rest of their lives. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that it has been eight years since I first came to this convention to talk with you about why I thought my husband should be president. <laughs> Remember how I told you about his character and conviction, his decency and his grace, the traits that we've seen every day that he served our country in the White House. <laughs> I also told you about our daughters, how they are the heart of our hearts, the center of our world, and during our time in the White House, we've had the joy of watching them grow from bubbly little girls into poised young women, a journey that started soon after we arrived in Washington, when they set off for their first day at their new school. I will never forget that winter morning as I watched our girls, just seven and 10 years old, pile into those black SUVs with all those big men with guns. <laughs> and I saw their little faces pressed up against the window. And the only thing I could think was, what have we done? <laughs> See, because at that moment, I realized that our time in the White House would form the foundation for who they would become. And how well we managed this experience could truly make or break them. That is what Barack and I think about every day as we try to guide and protect our girls through the challenges of this unusual life in the spotlight. During the Obama presidency, Barack and Michelle traveled extensively, bolstering America's reputation as a superpower and a respected nation. A beacon of hope to all democracies, the closeness of their bond always shone through, no matter the stage, country, or occasion. Barack and Michelle Obama had an excellent relationship throughout the presidency. I mean, it's any relationship is going to be tested when you're dealing with high levels of stress. And so it's not to say that their relationship didn't experience some bumps and some, uh, you know, tense discussions along the way, and they've admitted that. But they see themselves as a team. They see themselves as much stronger together uh, than apart. And they really respect each other. They see each other as equals. And I think during the entire presidency, they were able to weather a lot of storms, difficult storms that he faced, just, just being president and all the attacks he faced. Uh, they were able to weather this together and their relationship is probably stronger as a result. But it's really one of the few political marriages uh, that was just completely scandal free. That was really about a deep love that they shared for one another. That wasn't really about a marriage of political convenience. And, you know, both Republicans and Democrats alike would have to acknowledge that this was a very solid relationship. It was a model relationship uh, and one that a lot of other people could learn from. Their mutual love and respect for one another was evident. Their smiles never dulling since the day they took their vows back in 1992 on the south side of Chicago. Everywhere we went, we were welcomed with huge smiles and open arms and lots of rain, <laughs> which we handled. With the backing of such an accomplished education, Michelle Obama has shared a lot of her wisdom with a great deal of eloquence and grace. From the inspiring words of her powerful speeches to the introspective moments of thought-provoking prose in her memoirs. My advice to girls is always this, and this is what I tell my daughters every day. Do not be afraid to fail, because that oftentimes is the thing that keeps us as women and girls back because we think we have to be right. We think we have to be perfect. We think that we can't stumble. Um, and the only way you succeed in life, the only way you learn is by failing. It's not the failure, it's what you do after you fail. You know, do you let it eat you up? Do you quit? Do you give up? Or do you let it bolster you? Does it serve as, as the challenge in your mind 
to do more, to take some risks, to step outside of your comfort zone. And the last thing that I, I do want to say to all girls is that be supportive of each other. I mean, I, I just can't say this enough. We have to be our best friends, each other. That means we cannot be catty. We cannot compete and see one person's failure as our success. We can all rise together, okay? We can all win. And, and we're sometimes taught in our societies that we have to compete and we have to hold each other back in order for one of us to succeed. That is not true. We need each other. And all over the world, we have to be a team of women and girls who love each other and value each other and cherish one another. Because if we don't cherish each other, no one else will. So let's start there and start working together and find a way that we're going to lift up some other girl in our lives. Maybe it's a little sister, a neighbor, but you can be a mentor today. So do that. Do that work now. Get in the habit of that. All right? You all with me? You all have to be my yes. soldiers in this, all right? All right? During a 2016 DNC speech as the first African-American first lady, Michelle Obama made an impactful remark about the unease she felt living in a home that was built by slave labor. In a powerful quote, seen here in a clip from ABC. The story of generations of people who felt the lash of bondage, the shame of servitude, the sting of segregation, but who kept on striving and hoping and doing what needed to be done so that today I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. I think one of the most difficult and shameful aspects of American history is the history of slavery. And the fact that you have citizens whose ancestors were treated so terribly, were enslaved, weren't considered equals, weren't considered human beings. It's a legacy that lives on still to this day. I mean, you can still see the effects of it in the southern parts of the U.S. So for Michelle Obama, there was a lot of meaning to first just being the first African-American, first family, just living in this house. But her acknowledging the fact that this was a house that had been built by slaves. She held very personally the fact that the U.S. had come a long way, but there's a huge stain on its history. And it's not something that is going to go away uh, overnight. It's something that the U.S. still continues to grapple with. But I think for both Barack and Michelle, um, you know, they really understood the significance of, of their election. And it wasn't lost on them, you know, that only, you know, a couple hundred years ago, their ancestors would have been enslaved. everyone, and may I say for the last time officially, welcome to the White House. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Do you hear me? Young people, don't be afraid. Be focused. <laughs> be determined. Be hopeful. Be empowered. Empower yourselves with a good education. Then get out there and use that education to build a country worthy of your boundless promise. Lead by example with hope, never fear. The political landscape of the United States has shifted dramatically since the days of the Obama administration. But nonetheless, the impact of the work achieved by First Lady Michelle Obama has remained alive in the many hearts and minds she worked so hard to inspire. There's tremendous nostalgia for the Obamas. I mean, look what the U.S. is dealing with at the moment. It's just complete government disarray, investigations, disunity, polarization. Uh, it's very stressful for most Americans today in dealing with uh, the current administration. And this is even though the U.S. economy is actually doing fairly well. Uh, as a result, you know, a lot of Americans are really nostalgic about the Obamas. Those that were probably a little bit too critical of the Obamas either on the left or on the right, 
at least recognized that it was a period of direction, calm, prudency, where the U.S. could say that they were a world leader, that they held some moral high ground. And I think as we move on into this new era, a period of politics that is more polarized than ever, uh, you're seeing the need for a type of a chief executive who can comfort people, who can unite people, who's articulate, who's educated, who knows how to say the right things in the right moments and doesn't try to divide us. Despite leaving the White House, Michelle has continued to maintain a strong presence on the global stage and continues to work towards building a better, more inclusive world that she always strived for. You have someone who is incredibly Ambitious, successful, hardworking. She balanced this with also being very maternal, very warm, very caring, very real. She was very civic minded, but hated politics. She was very authentic, very frank and honest, uh, had a very strong strength of character, very strong moral character. She was assertive when she needed to be but she was also savvy to know when she needed to take a supporting role. She had a very wholesome upbringing and she carried that on into the White House, ensuring that her kids had this same type of upbringing, albeit how strange it must have been to be growing up in the White House. She is a rock for Barack. She was one of the most popular first ladies in US history. The most important thing for you to do is to be able to pick yourself up when you fall because most of life is falling. <laughs> and the real challenge is, how do you get back up? First Lady was never a role she expected, but no one can say it wasn't a role she made wholly her own. Her continued popularity is evidenced by the international success of her autobiography, Becoming Michelle Obama. She is testament to her ethos of self-love, hard work, and family that an African-American girl from a working class background on the south side of Chicago can become one of the most important and magnetic voices of the 21st century. I want to close today by simply saying thank you. Thank you for everything you do for our kids and for our country. Being your first lady has been the greatest honor of my life. And I hope I've made you proud.